Welcome, welcome to the Yale Faculty Book Talk Series. I'm Teresa Miguel, the Law Librarian uh, here at Yale Law School. And this evening's book talk features professors Michael Gratz and Ian Shapiro on their second collaboration. Uh, their first book is Death by a Thousand Cuts back in 2006. Uh, Death by a Thousand Cuts, The Fight Over Taxing Inherited Wealth. But today we are here for their new book, Hot Off the Presses, released just today, The Wolf at the Door, The Menace of Economic Insecurity and How to Fight It. So I'm going to do brief introductions, then turn it over to our guests, and we'll go until 7 o'clock this evening. So first, Professor Ian Shapiro is Sterling Professor of Political Science here at Yale University. He has written widely and influentially on democracy, justice, and the methods of social inquiry. A native of South Africa, he received his JD from Yale Law School, right here, and his PhD from the Yale Political Science Department, where he has taught since 1984 and served as chair from 1999 to 2004. Professor Shapiro also served as Henry R. Luce, director of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies from 2004 until just last year. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Professor Shapiro is the author of numerous books and scholarly articles, and his current research concerns the relations between democracy and the distribution of income and wealth. Professor Mike, Michael Gratz is the Justice S. Hotchkiss Professor of Law Emeritus here at Yale Law School, where he's taught since 1983. He is also the Columbia Alumni Professor of Tax Law at Columbia Law School. Professor Gratz has written dozens of books and articles on a wide range of topics, including US tax law and policy, international taxation, health policy, legal history, and social insurance issues. In 1992, Professor Gratz served as assistant to the secretary and special counsel at the Treasury Department. In 1990 to 91, he served as Treasury Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy. Professor Gratz has been a John, uh, a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellow and received an award from Esquire Magazine for courses and work in connection with the provision of shelter for the homeless. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2013, he was awarded the Daniel M. Holland Medal by the National Tax Association for Outstanding Contributions to the Study and Practice of Public Finance. So please join me in welcoming and congratulating Professor Shapiro and Gratz on the publication of their brand new book, The Wolf at the Door. Welcome. <laughs> Does it, does it see them? You know, pass them around, sure. we have a couple of books that we could pass around. We uh, unfortunately didn't get enough from Harvard University Press to give them away. <laughs> There's plenty of copies in the library already. Exactly. Um, so today is the publication date of our new book, and it's really uh, perfect that we're here to talk about it, uh, since there were more Yale law students, undergraduates, and graduate political science students that contributed to our thinking about these issues uh, than we can count um, over the years. Uh, we had seminar after seminar uh, trying to figure out what we thought about this. Um, I think it's fair to say that our book is about anger, fear, and resentment, um, three cheerful uh, topics. Um, in 2016, uh, we saw massive shocks to establishment parties, uh, both with the Brexit a referendum and Donald Trump's election uh, as president of the United States. Uh, Fox News uh, bad boy Tucker Carlson uh, said in the wake of Donald Trump's uh, unexpected victory that year that Trump's election wasn't about Trump, it was a throbbing middle finger in the face of America's ruling class. It was a howl of rage. Happy countries don't elect Donald Trump. Desperate ones do. So Tucker Carlson is not wrong about everything. Um, and so in 2016, uh, we saw two populists uh, running uh, for president, one from the left and one from the right. Um, it turns out that um, Donald Trump uh, got 14,000 votes, basically, in his 
primary campaign and 14 million. 14 million, sorry, thanks. I always have trouble with numbers. 14, 14 million votes in his uh, primary uh, campaign. And uh, Bernie Sanders got 13.2 million in his primary campaign. Hillary Clinton got it just over 16,000, 16 million, sorry. Um, and uh, Bernie, as you know, then and now, rails against uh, billionaires and the very rich. Um, and one of the things that is widely overlooked about Donald Trump is that although he ran as a populist, he never mentioned inequality. And in fact, he bragged about uh, being a billionaire, whether he is or not. Um, and uh, just this week, at the Daytona 500, to great cheers, he rode around in a armored uh, limousine uh, of, uh, uh, constructed by Lincoln, as I, as I understand it. Um, he uh, also bragged about his cleverness in avoiding taxes uh, during that period. Um, all of these things would make Bernie furious. Um, Brookings reported uh, just this last week in a careful analysis that uh, two-thirds of U.S. GDP um, exists in the congressional districts that Hillary won. Um, so this tells you a lot about what's going on in the rest of the country. Um, the, uh, obviously, California, Chicago, New York, New Jersey, parts of Connecticut uh, are involved in that. Um, so it is our view that the world is currently ripe for populist charlatans uh, who uh, uh, exploit economic insecurity and uh, promise uh, snake oil as solutions, things like uh, border walls, uh, tariffs, and barriers to uh, immigration. So our question is, what is to be done? And what's unique about our book, I think, is that it is a book throughout that combines an analysis of policy and politics. Um, and uh, we became convinced that policy without politics is uh, really inadequate. Uh, we always cite for this uh, Thomas Piketty's a conclusion to his uh, bestseller, uh, Capital, uh, his bestseller on Capital, in which he uh, argues that what we need is a global wealth tax. Uh, he, of course, uh, assumes, as economists often do, that we have a global government that might do such a thing. Um, and so uh, it's not terribly useful. He has an, another proposal in his new book and elsewhere for a European assembly, which also doesn't seem terribly timely. Um, on the other hand, uh, politics without policy is, is blind. Um, we, our best example, I think, in the book, although we have several of uh, politics without policy, um, is the uh, efforts uh, to expand home ownership that led to the subprime mortgage crisis uh, and then the failures to respond to it appropriately. Um, in the broader context, we talk about uh, the impacts of globalization. Uh, the fundamental problem is that uh, world economics are global, uh, but all politics is national, if not local. Um, we view technology as likely to be a greater threat to jobs and wages than globalization going forward. Um, and we combine all this, as many of you know, with a slow growth, an aging population, and the collapse of private sector labor unions as a counterforce politically and economically to uh, businesses, particularly large uh, businesses. So all of this makes it harder to govern. It makes voters um, anxious for change. Um, and it created um, the rise of anti-elite groups within both uh, political parties. Um, the challenge that we address in our book is how to respond to uh, what we think of as 
probably permanent uh, wage security, insecurity, and uh, how to think about politics that can be effective in light of uh, what we know about today's uh, policies. Now, the uh, central questions of the book are what are the challenges and prospects going forward, and what are the building blocks of legislative politics that are necessary to get us to a better place? I was on a panel recently with Heather Boucher, who um, you may know uh, is a very well-known and respected economist who's just written a book on inequality um, and uh, was supposed to be Hillary Clinton's chairman or chairperson of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors. Um, she, like so many others, uh, views politics through the lens of the median voter. Uh, the question is, what does the median voter want? The theory is that people will uh, hover around the center and the median voter. And the political science evidence is uh, strong that what median voters want doesn't seem to matter a whole lot in legislative politics. And our book is about legislative politics, not electoral politics. We instead look at politics through the lens of a game known as the divide a dollar game. I won't go through it in detail because we don't have enough time, uh, but you should play it at home with your friends. I have. Uh, the idea is that uh, you need to divide a dollar by majority rule. And every time I've played it, it starts off, let's give each one a third. Um, and then it goes, no, let's you and me take 50 <laughs> um, and leave uh, somebody out. Um, and then somebody says, well, I'll give you 60 if you'll give me 40 and uh, 70, 30. And then somebody else comes in and says to the 30 person, well, I'll give you 50, 50. And we're, it just never ends. Um, and so um, the problem is that if you look at politics through this divide a dollar lens, um, you have a radical instability in, in, in redistributive politics. That instability is cabined in the United States through a whole series of institutional arrangements, which are very important, including uh, uh, separation of powers and a bicameral legislature and the filibuster in the House and so on. What this leads us to is what we call six building blocks of effective distributive politics, the most important of which is that you need to think about coalitions uh, that will succeed and that will not be thrown off course by another blocking uh, coalition. Uh, we conclude that in order to succeed, these coalitions have to have moral commitments, not just dividing a dollar. Uh, they have to pursue uh, what we call proximate goals. Uh, they have to entrench those gains that they get for the longer term. Uh, Bob Greenstein, the head of the Center for Policy and, and Budget Priorities, uh, said that you need to go two steps forward, and then when things turn on you, you need to go only a half step backwards. And that seems uh, exactly right. Uh, in order to do all this, you need resources and you need leadership. And we talk about all of these um, throughout the book as we talk about uh, policy. And so uh, we, when we turn to policy, we have three chapters, um, um, one on creating jobs, uh, mainly through infrastructure, uh, which we talk about. Uh, the second is making work pay in which we talk about the universal basic income, um, the minimum wage, uh, and an expansion in the earned income tax credit. Um, and then we talk about universal, or something we call universal adjustment assistance. And we're gonna talk about those uh, at least briefly now. So I think Ian is now gonna pick up, pick up the story. Okay. Um, so the, the central substantive argument of the book is that it's more important to focus on the insecurity that people, uh, Michael, have been talking about than on overall inequality in the economy. And the reasons for this are several. The first and basic one is that inequality is rampant, 
insecurity is rampant in the U.S. economy. Uh, uh, an arresting statistic is that 40% of Americans will, will report in polling that if they had to come up with a $400 emergency expenditure, uh, they, they wouldn't have the money and, and they wouldn't be able to put it on a credit card that they could pay off at the end of the month. Um, but more, more important and structurally, uh, an 18-year-old today should expect to, to change jobs between 12 and 15 times during their working lives. So the, the era when somebody would finish their K through 12 or maybe K through college education and then have an employer for a lifetime is gone. Um, now, that might not be so frightening for people on the, on the right side of the information revolution who might bounce through a few startups and then go to get an MBA um, while building up several million dollars in an, in an IRA. Um, but for the tens of millions on the other side of the information revolution, the permanent employment insecurity is terrifying. And it's very easily, uh, therefore, played to and exploited. So the, that's the, the first thing, that employment insecurity is, is rampant and is likely to remain that way. Secondly, um, uh, what reinforces the insecurity is some massive um, wage stagnation that's been experienced through much of the economy over the past four decades, where incomes have, have basically, in real terms, uh, been flat, and indeed, often the, the only way in which a family has retained its earnings powers to have gone from a, a one earner to a two earner family. Um, we see statistics about um, all-time lows in unemployment. Uh, what those statistics don't capture is that many people are downwardly mobile in terms of the kinds of jobs they actually get, uh, both in, in remuneration and in status. Um, so there's, there's this long-term uh, employment insecurity accompanied by a wage stagnation that indeed is only, in, in the case of tens of millions of people, only prevented from becoming uh, real declines in, in income by uh, changing in the, the, the number of people working in a, in a family. Um, this is, by the way, true increasingly up and down the occupational uh, scale. I think one of the most revealing statistics, if you look at Trump primary voters, not not general election voters in the primaries when there were many other choices on the Republican side, the SES was as follows. A third earned less than the median income for a family of four, um, $50,000. A third earned between fifty and 100000 And a third earned over 100000 So two-thirds of Trump's primary voters were um, earn, earning above the median income. That doesn't mean they don't experience employment insecurity. Uh, many, in, and, and indeed Dan Markowitz's recent book documents quite a bit of this, but many of the um, jobs that are now going to technology are middle income and, and upper middle income jobs. So, so the employment insecurity, we shouldn't just think of it as sort of Joe Lunchbucket uh, losing his or her job. It's, it's really a much more general uh, phenomenon in the, in the bottom three quintiles of the economy, and perhaps increasingly so. Um, and that brings us to another reason why focusing on insecurity is so important. Um, we know from Kahneman and Tversky and the whole revolution in behavioral economics that uh, loss aversion is a more powerful motivator to action than the prospect of gains. And one of the things that was so brilliant in maybe by blind staggering luck uh, rather than strategy, but in, in uh, Make America Great Again is precisely this notion that something's been taken away from you and your and people like you, and I'm going to get it back. Uh, this is this appealing to the idea, this, this fear of loss or, or anger about having experienced losses. Um, and if you read the sociological books on um, 
from Trump voters like Arlie Hoke Shields' book about Louisiana, um, uh, or Catherine Kramer's book about Wisconsin. They're all about uh, feeding on the resentment of people who think they've lost something that was rightfully theirs, who see their children as doing less well than themselves, and uh, looking for something, somebody to restore this. And this is why the fact that Trump never talked about inequality, but talked about these things uh, is so important, because these voters are not really interested in what the top 1% is or isn't making, uh, but rather in what they think has been taken away from them and what should be restored. And so it's, it's from the lens of this central focus on insecurity uh, that we, we explore various policy that could be, that have been proposed and we, what we think should be proposed given uh, that we really want to do policy in ways that are politi politically realistic. And I'll just talk about uh, one, of the, one of the areas where we do this, which is looking at how, how the government should be involved in improving wages. And there are really three options out there that, that, that have been floating. If you look at the Democratic primaries, for example, um, one is Andrew Yang, uh, Andrew Yang's um, pushing the idea of a universal basic income, uh, $12,000 to everybody uh, a year from regardless of employment. Uh, this is, this is uh, a very unrealistic proposal because of what Michael was talking about earlier. There really is no effective coalition to do this. Uh, he says, he, Andrew Yang says, you know, there's bipartisan support for this. But the, the truth is, if you look at the people on the right who are supporting this, like Charles Murray, they're supporting it as a substitute for existing welfare policies, Social Security, Medicare, and so forth. Whereas people on the left are thinking of it as, as a, sub, as a, as a sub, supplement to that. And, and uh, you, you could never actually get any kind of political coalition uh, to achieve it. And if you think about the blocking coalitions, um, uh, for instance, unions, if you look at European countries where there have been referendums, Switzerland had a referendum on this, organized labor came out against it. Uh, so for, for these reasons, uh, and particularly um, Michael mentioned the importance of a moral argument. Uh, in, a, in, in 21st century America, selling the idea to vote is that uh, the government should just give everybody a check regardless of work. Uh, isn't, isn't going to do any better here than it did in Switzerland or in, in, Nor in some Nordic countries that have experimented with this. A second argument is the minimum wage. We have Bernie thumping the table yesterday saying, how dare um, Mike Bloomberg be uh, running for for president when he, you know, he's a multi-billionaire who's, uh, who's opposed to the minimum wage. So you, you can get coalitions to increase the minimum wage to some extent, and we now see state by state by state uh, uh, moves to get it up to about $15 an hour by 2021, 2022. Um, the, the, the difficulty with minimum wage uh, legislation is that it creates incentives for a race to the bottom. So the states that increase the minimum wage will tend to drive employment to states uh, that don't increase it. And if the U.S. jacks up its national federal minimum wage, it'll tend to encourage jobs to go offshore. Of course, there are many things that uh, push in the opposite direction, and, and it's not completely deterministic. But it is a basic dynamic in employment markets that capital is going to go to where uh, labor is cheapest. And uh, it's, it's easier to move capital in today's world than it's ever been. So instead, we what we argue for in the book is um, substantial expansion of the earned income tax credit. This is a refundable tax credit that started out very small in the 1970s. Uh, one feature of it, it really has had bipartisan support. It started out in the Nixon uh, and Ford administrations. Um, it's basically an income support. Uh, the federal government subsidizes wages and uh, actually writes people a check if their income is full sufficiently uh, to, to qualify for it. 
It has been expanded multiple times since the 1970s, and today it's by, it's by far the biggest uh, poverty reduction and income support program uh, uh, financed by the federal government. In 2019, uh, $61 billion was spent on the EITC. Uh, the, the year before that, uh, when combined with the child's tax credit, it, uh, it lifted about 8.9 uh, million people out of poverty. It is, uh, there are about 25 million Americans who qualify for the EITC. There are also state EITCs. And if you think about it in contrast to the minimum wage, state level EITCs, the built-in incentive is for a race to the top. Because if, a st if one state offers good income supports for companies to move there, uh, then other states have to do it if, if they want to compete. So this exact opposite uh, incentive dynamic built into the EITC than you get with a minimum wage. So this just is to give you a flavor of the kinds of policies that we argue for and the way in which we argue for them, where we, we're both trying to find policies that will actually address the core problem uh, and for which viable coalitions can be built to create and implement that. Michael. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to go very long, having gone long the first time, uh, because I want to make sure people get a chance to ask us questions or make comments. Um, one thing that Ian did not mention that I commend to you if you haven't seen it is uh, uh, the Dutch ethnologist uh, Franz de Waal has an experiment that he did with capuchin monkeys uh, where the two monkeys are in the cages and the uh, person is feeding them cucumbers and feeds one cucumbers and uh, the monkey is quite happy. And then he starts feeding the one right next door with visibility between them grapes. And the uh, first monkey starts throwing the cucumbers at the person who's feeding them and refuses to eat them. And so this is really an example of local comparisons about economic insecurity rather than what somebody in a completely different uh, area of the country is, is making uh, uh, on their ownership of Facebook, uh, for example. Um, I just want to mention uh, other policies we talk about. I mentioned infrastructure as a way to create jobs. We talk a lot about the politics of infrastructure. It is also something that has been supported bipartisanly. Um, the finance of it has been difficult, but there are a lot of examples. Uh, one need only go to LaGuardia to see it, a good example of a public-private partnership uh, to uh, uh, really uh, modernize uh, in, an important piece of infrastructure. Um, the one sort of, I think, new idea that is in the book is something that we call universal adjustment assistance. Uh, it, uh, it's not the only new idea in the book, I should, I should mention, but it, uh, uh, it's designed to move people from unemployment to reemployment. Uh, it is, in some sense, a combination of unemployment insurance, which is incredibly weak for a whole series of reasons, including regressive taxation and a state-based program. And it covered, I think, less than a third of the people who were unemployed during the uh, Great Recession. Um, and trade adjustment assistance, which actually had in the legislation a whole series of benefits, including retraining for people who lost their jobs because of trade but uh, for a whole series of reasons, nobody really got it. Um, so um, we really are taking these two ideas and combining them into something we call uh, universal adjustment assistance. We also talk in the book, and then I'll stop. We talk in the book and are happy to talk here tonight about health insurance and what might be done with health insurance to expand it, where uh, we have a slightly different idea than either uh, Mayor Pete or, or uh, Bernie and Elizabeth uh, on this. Um, we talk about child care and universal pre-K. Uh, the child care story is actually rather depressing. The universal pre-K story, on the other hand, is actually quite a positive story, including in many red states where you might not imagine it. 
uh, Alabama's program, for example, has been rated the best in the country. Uh, we talk about education, where we're not uh, quite so optimistic for reasons we're happy to talk about, K-12 education. We talk about place-based incentives, including uh, something called opportunity zones, which are in the new legislation, uh, which uh, we're not, uh, we don't endorse. I'll, I'll put it more mildly than we put it in the book. Um, so we talk about lots of other other things. We talk a little bit about paying for it through taxes and debt. Um, and then um, um, the other big point that is just worth mentioning is that in thinking about legislative coalitions, we put business interests at the center, mainly because businesses are the most important uh, coalition force at both the federal level and at the state uh, level in today's politics, uh, especially given the demise of private sector unions in the United States. Um, and so we think that business needs to be uh, in the coalition and it needs to do well uh, in, in, in the coalition. For those of you who pay attention to these things, the Business Roundtable just said that uh, American businesses should not uh, be focused on um, solely on maximizing shareholder value, but should uh, be engaged with their communities and with their employees. Uh, we think they should do this through the legislative process. And so our proposals, like the EITC rather than a minimum wage, uh, tend to be ones that businesses can actually uh, get behind. Um, and we uh, argue at the end, uh, essentially, we don't argue it this way because it's too cliched, but uh, that if businesses are, are, are not at the table, they'll be on the table. And so uh, um, they have a lot to fear um, if they don't uh, sort of get into the uh, game of supporting their workers and their communities. So with that, we'll stop.